Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the kind introduction. Thank you all for coming on uh, so early. Um, this is uh, some disclosure. Um, essentially, I'll try to demonstrate uh, some of the uh, applications that we can use uh, with this system. So essentially, you have a flat panel NGO as well as a multi-slice CT scanner within the same room uh, sharing a common uh, table. So we can use the CT scan uh, and NGO machine separately or uh, I guess the power is when you use them uh, in combination. And it's uh, easy to switch between the modalities. Either you move the table or you uh, propel the CT on tracks or do both. So uh, this system has gone by different names. In Japan, it's called IVRCT, which stands for Interventional Radiology CT, and is developed by Professor Arai from uh, NCC Tokyo. And there are many installations in Japan, but outside Japan, even to this day, they are quite limited. Uh, our hospital is fortunate enough to install one uh, in 2008. And over the time, you can see that there's improvement in the NGO system as well as the CT system. And the latest iteration, I think in 2013, they have the Aculon 1 uh, in combination with the uh, NGO. And uh, I think last year and the year before, uh, we have the uh, Aculon Prime and the large ball uh, Aculon. And this is to facilitate CT guided punctures. You have more space uh, to do that. So this is our setup, uh, the control room. So you have the various computer system controlling various parts of the system. And uh, pardon the quality of the video is from the iPhone. Uh, essentially just to demonstrate to you is a full-fledged ceiling mounted uh, flat panel detector. And uh, our CT scanner is just a 16 slice, but uh, it's good enough uh, for uh, most of our applications. So as you can see, it's relatively easy to uh, switch from the different modalities. So for us, uh, the applications that we use the system for, uh, essentially we use it like an NGO suite or a CT suite. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the, the power is, is the using them combined. So either for some uh, difficult uh, drainages or biopsy where we need CT guidance and then some floral uh, guidance. But the main uh, power is to be able to do intra-arterial uh, CTA, which I'll demonstrate in a while. So the original intent for the system when they developed it in Japan was to facilitate the performance of uh, CT arterial portography and uh, CT hepatic angiography. So in those early days, as you know, this is the gold standard for the diagnosis uh, of HCC, which relies on the fact that there's a dual uh, uh, blood supply to the liver. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, these techniques, or fortunately, has been replaced by multiphasic CT and MRI. So because of that, uh, I think in Japan, they use this system a lot now for very ultra-selective kind of taste, which again, I'll demonstrate with some examples later. So this is how it looks like. So in the porterography, the portal veins are pacified and tumors appear as a filling defect. And the corresponding uh, hepatic angio, it will be uh, hyper intense. And this is uh, another example. But as you can imagine, this is quite troublesome. You have first have to insert the catheter in the SMA then you transfer to the CT room, you do the portography, transfer back to NGO, insert into hepatic artery, and you move them back and forth. So this process can take uh, multiple hours, and that's provided the catheter did not drop out during the shift. But with uh, NGO CT, you really do not need to transfer the patient. Essentially, you, you just uh, move the table or the, the CT. So this video just uh, demonstrate how this is done. So as you can imagine, you can do this multiple times, uh, and, um, uh, which is something that is essential when you want to do ultra-selective uh, taste. Sorry. Uh, oh, how do I get to the next slide? Uh, OK. So as, as again, sorry to keep emphasizing this, but uh, indeed, this is uh, any applications that you need intra arterial CTA, this is the, the thing to go. I think some of us may argue that comb beam CT can do the same, but the image quality is definitely not quite the same. So just to illustrate, this is a HCC, unfortunately quite hypovascular, so uh, you can't uh, really make out uh, where the blood supply is coming from. So if you do the intra arterial CTA, you know that the right hepatic artery is supplying this part of the tumour, the left hepatic is supplying this part, but there is part, this part of the tumour that is not accounted for. So it then prompts us to 
look further for where this, the, the other supply is, and in this case, it's from the collateral of the gastroepiploid artery. So this kind of information is definitely required if you want to do uh, ultra-selective stays, as well as uh, the radioembolization. So these are the common procedures that we use our system for. Um, so in conventional versus uh, super-selective stays, I think uh, for conventional stays, a lot of us are just doing low-bar stays. Uh, and this is uh, one such example of a previous hepatectomy, and then there's now recurrence. And uh, basically, you just whack the whole uh, liver. But for super selective taste, you are just going for the tumor supply. And this is uh, arising from the Japanese experience. This is a landmark paper which shows that if you can get lipidol uh, all the way into the portal venues, the recurrence uh, rate is very low. But to do this, you need an angio CT system because just fluoroscopy will not uh, be able to do it. This is because this allows you to identify the tumor supply accurately, confidently, and quickly. And uh, you minimize the embolized area, sparing normal uh, tumor. And most important, you can have immediate verification of lipidol uptake by the tumor. So this is an example of the right lobe tumor. This is a CTAP, so this is a, a filling defect. And on the angio, you could just vaguely see the blush here. Um, so we go uh, selective and even more selective and before you do your uh, embolization you verify with a CTHA so you know for sure that you are, this, this vessel is supplying the tumour so the lipidol stain and immediately after you do a plain CT you confirm the lipidol uptake and you could see that you could spare a lot of liver just a very focal uh, taste this is another example uh, lent to me by Dr. Arai, a caudic HCC, the CTAP, negative uh, filling defect and uh, enhancement on HA. Uh, on the angiogram, you could hardly see where it is. Um, so you basically need angio CT to verify that these are indeed the supply to the tumour. And not only that, you could see that parts of the tumour are not being supplied by this vessel. So you have to hunt for the other vessel and this is proof that you have now managed to capture the whole tumour. And this is the post uh, it taste, uh, CT showing that this is where you want to go. So without angio CT, it's impossible to perform work like this. So for our institution, uh, we do more uh, radioembolization than super selective taste, and we have exclusively used this system to help us uh, to uh, improve the safety and uh, efficacy uh, of this procedure. As uh, it's a learned audience, we, you know that uh, Y90 has been proven to be effective uh, for the treatment of HCC. So radioembolization is quite similar to taste, but the, there is much higher risk of complications because the non-target embolization is not so forgivable compared to taste. So you can get uh, radiation-induced uh, injury, especially those that we fear is the gastrointestinal ulceration, oftentimes needing gastrectomy uh, to, to treat it. And angio CT is a perfect tool for this. So for radioembolization, we do all our planning studies uh, in the angio CT suite, basically to uh, have a detailed tumor supply study. We use it uh, to, to calculate personalized kind of dosimetry, which I will show you in a while. And most important is to identify the extra hepatic uh, supply for prophylactic embolization. So as mentioned earlier, these are the feared uh, complications and angio CT is very useful to help you identify such things. So most guidelines will recommend prophylactic coembolization to prevent uh, extra hepatic deposition of Y90. But even with extensive coiling, there is still a reported 4% risk of injury. And I think the reason for that is because the anatomy is, is so complex. So these are just uh, some examples uh, of the coembolization before Y90. And as you can see from this study, the variance uh, of the falciform and gastric artery from the liver is, is just tremendous. As it's impossible to, uh, to know everything by heart. And um, we managed to reduce our coembolization rate by performing IACTA to, to ensure no bowel enhancement before we deliver the Y90. So this is an example of a huge uh, HCC. Um, so most of the cases, we will do an intra-arterial CTA before we release uh, the particle. So if the intra-arterial CTA do not show any bowel enhancement, we generally do not coil embolize. On the other hand, 
if the, the intra-arterial CTA shows enhancement, then we will go hunt down where the enhancement comes from. This is another case. Um, if you look at the left hepatic angiogram, I think even for the most experienced, there's doubt, you know, you might raise doubt whether there is a gastric enhancement. But if you do the intra-arterial CTA, there is no doubt that there is gastric enhancement. So once we see this, we will hunt for the gastric artery and we embolize it and we, make sure we repeat the IACTA, make sure that there's no more gastric enhancement and then we proceed uh, with the Y90 deployment. So it adds a lot of uh, operator confidence and we do not worry too much about anatomy. So as long as the intra-arterial CTA do not show bowel enhancement, we don't bother to look for it. If it shows enhancement, then we hunt down where the supply is from. This is one of our earlier cases. We weren't familiar with the Falsumom artery and end up having uh, radiation and dermatitis. And we have since shown, this is our own publication, that uh, intra-arterial CTA is superior to uh, conventional CTA or even the CT in detecting this artery. So this is an example. I think to the uninitiated, you might not be able to see the falciform artery. But if you do, the intra-arterial CTA is very obvious. Uh, this is the reconstruction image. And in this particular case, even the spec CT showed the, the falciform artery. This is another case, again, very clear where the falciform artery is. So uh, we hunt it down, uh, embolize it, and then deliver the Y90. This is a Bramstra lung after the Y90 showing that there is no leak into the falciform artery territory. Um, because of angio CT, we are also the first group to be uh, injecting Y90 into the inferior phrenic artery for his CC. So in this particular case, there is significant part of the uh, tumor was supplied by the inferior phrenic artery. So we coembolize the diaphragmatic muscular branches, and just before we deploy the Y90 here, we do the angio CT to make sure that there is no enhancement of the diaphragm before we injected the Y90. This is the other thing that we do. Uh, for Y90, I think uh, most people would use the body surface area to calculate the dose, uh, but for us, we customize uh, each uh, patient with the dosimetry down to the amount of dose that we inject per artery. And this is done by individually calculating the dose of the artery based on the intra-arterial CTA. Uh, I think it would be incomplete to mention comb beam CT. Uh, I think the technology is such that now it's uh, quite uh, common for most angio systems to have comb beam CT. But comb beam CT still suffers uh, some disadvantages. I think it definitely takes a lot more time to set up the comb beam CT. The field of view is limited um, and it is very prone to a respiratory uh, artifact. But all these are not the problem with the intra-arterial uh, CT because you are having a CT scan uh, in, in the room. We have also studied the dose uh, of comb beam CT versus this angio CT. And this is the Siemens Dynan CT, uh, Toshiba's own comb beam CT, and the angio CT. You could see that the dose is much less uh, compared to the comb beam CT. So just quickly run through some uh, other applications. So bronchial artery uh, embolization, I think we always fear the spinal cord uh, ischemia. In this particular case, I think it's quite easy to identify the spinal artery of Adam Kiawicz, the classical hairpin loop. But on intra-arterial CT, no doubt that you can see the artery. This is another case, not so classical, but when we run the intra-arterial CT, you could see some supply towards the spinal cord, so we have to be careful. The next three cases, again, there is supply towards the midline. Not sure whether there's minor supply. Um, but all this, when we run the intra-arterial CT, there is no supply to the spinal canal. So we could deliver the embolics uh, with confidence. This is another case, a lower lobe uh, kind of uh, bronchiectasis. Uh, we found a vessel that seems to supply the area. Fortunately, we run the intra-arterial CTA. It was actually supplying the esophagus. So if we do the embolization, we potentially could have killed the esophagus. Acute GI bleeding is something, again, that we use a lot. This is a conventional uh, mesentric angiogram showing bleeding. But on angiogram, we couldn't really see the bleeding well. So we do an intra-arterial CTA through the SMA, and you could clearly demonstrate the extraversation and the feeding vessel. So this serves as a good roadmap for us uh, to do coy embolization. And we did do a retrospective review and we've shown that uh, intra-arterial CTA is superior in the detection of GI bleed compared to uh, DSA. So in terms of that, because of the better anatomical delineation, 
uh, and the contrast uh, resolution it is definitely superior. And also, very importantly, a negative CTA gives you the confidence that there is uh, no uh, active bleeding. This is a CA pancreas. Uh, we did a PTC. It was quite a traumatic one. As you could see, there's a lot of blood clots uh, at the end of the procedure. Uh, so the patient went for a Whipple's uh, operation. And before we pulled out the catheter, we did the cholangiogram, showing the HJ was OK. But immediately when we pulled out, there was spurting of blood from the puncture site, and the patient became hypotensive. So, so because we have the CT there, we just do a, the, just a normal IV CTA, and you could see contrast extravasating into the bowel ducts. This was the pre-op CT showing the bowel duct. And immediately, we can do an angiogram and call the pseudoaneurysm. Another case, pancreatitis causing a splenic artery pseudoaneurysm. The angiogram couldn't show it. When we run the intra-arterial CTA, we could demonstrate it. We couldn't get a stable catheter position to embolize this, so we inject some lipidol through there and then percutaneously puncture the pseudoaneurysm, injected glue, and this is the angiogram showing preservation of the splenic artery and obliteration uh, of the pseudoaneurysm. Type 2 endolic, this is a great system uh, for treating type 2 endolic. You puncture under CT guidance, you pull him up to the angio and complete the embolization from there. Complex ablations as well. This is a tumour that is near the IVC to reduce the heat sink effect. You want to put a balloon. So in the NGO suite system, you don't have to shift the patient around. Uh, and oftentimes, you can get very good result. This is a more complex case, again, loaned to me by Dr. Arai, uh, left lobe, uh, his CC. So this, we, I think he gave taste to the left hepatic artery first. And then under CT guidance, he separated the stomach from the liver using an angioplasty balloon filled with air. So you could see that you can do this under CT with fluoro. You can uh, position several of these and uh, do a good uh, ablation. So in conclusion, the angio CT uh, gives you readily available cross-sectional information, which is uh, very important for a good uh, taste and uh, radio embolization and many other complex embolization procedures, we have found this to be extremely uh, useful. It definitely improves our confidence in many of these procedures, and it's definitely a useful tool and not an expensive gimmick. Thank you very much for your attention.